Okay, so next we're going to talk a little bit more about the grammar um, and how we can use layers of grammatical elements to create more complicated plots and to, to keep changing plots and, and add more information. And so what we've done so far is we've talked about three different types of, of components of the grammar of graphics. We have data, we have aesthetics, and we have geometries. And so one way of thinking about this, a good analogy, is to think about it as layers, um, where we take a data set, and then we add aesthetics onto it, and then we add geometries onto it. And so we say, take that troops data, and say x is the latitude and y is the longitude, or the other way around. I always forget which is x and y with latitude and longitude. Um, take the size and map that onto survivors, and take the direction and map that onto color, and then use a path to plot that. And so that's we're taking the data, mapping the aesthetics onto it, and then adding geometries onto it. And so we have those three layers there. Um, when we're doing actual ggplot code, you're just adding each of those functions with a plus. And so you're saying, take this ggplot, add it to geom path. Um, when we did the gapminder data, we had the, the ggplot with the gapminder information in it. Um, then we said geom point, and then we said scale x log 10. And so we just kept adding these different layers. So, so far we've talked about these three layers, geometries, aesthetics, and data. Um, there are lots of different possible aesthetics. Um, so far you've seen size and color. You can also use different shapes. And so if we were printing that gapminder data set, for instance, or that gapminder plot, for instance, and we didn't have a color printer, we could actually, instead of coloring each of the points, we could have them be shaped. And so maybe circle could be Africa, the triangle could be Asia, the square could be the Americas, something like that. There's lots of, there's like 20 different shapes that R can use. Um, you can also have a continuous color scale. Where this is good if you have actual numbers, that, like a range of numbers. So if you notice here, this discrete color is for like actual categories. Um, this continuous color is if you had, like if we mapped life expectancy onto the dots, um, then it could be lighter colors would be lower life expectancy and darker colors would be higher life expectancy, something like that. You have a, a gradient or a range. You can fill points or fill boxes or fill um, elements of the charts um, with specific colors. Um, and you can change the transparency of color of points as well. And so you can have maybe uh, we could if we added this alpha aesthetic to that gapminder plot, um, the countries with higher population would be darker and the countries with um, less population would be kind of more invisible. Um, there are other situations, more real situations, where you would do that. Um, that's one way of fixing overplotting. Um, if you have lots and lots and lots of points, one thing you can do is make them all very, very transparent. And so they're, if they're overlapping, they kind of build on each other so you get darker areas in a scatter plot. Um, so those are the different things um, that you can map data to, the different aesthetics in a graph. Um, there are also lots of different geoms or, geom or geometric shapes that you can use with those aesthetics. And so we've seen like geom point with the Gapminder data. Um, there's a whole host of these. If you go to the ggplot documentation, if you go, um, if you can search for ggplot2 documentation or click on this link right here and it'll take you there. Um, it'll have examples of dozens of these things. Um, there's a ton of different ways of, of mapping or putting geometric shapes onto the mappings you've created. So you can make bar charts, you can add text, you can do box plots and violin plots and density plots, you can do maps, um, you can do all sorts of things. Um, and the, the neat thing about this is once you have the aesthetics mapped, the geometry can change so you might have points and you might want to replace those points with hexagonal shapes or you might have columns and you want to put those as like a heat map um, all you really have to do to change it from like a column chart or a bar chart to a heat map is you change the geom uh, function that you're using instead of like you don't have to actually click on anything to to reshape the data or anything you're just going to use the same aesthetic mappings but you're going to show it as a heat map instead of as a column chart and so um, again, there's, there's advantages to separating this idea of data and aesthetics and geoms.
And so, yeah, for the rest of this course, we're going to be covering all sorts of these, these different geoms. And so as we start getting into specific topics, like how to show relationships or how to show uh, distributions or how to show uncertainty, um, each of those general topics uses specific geoms to show that. Um, with bar charts and box plots and density plots and violin plots and all of these different things, those are all just different geoms that we're going to be using. And so, um, again, we can't possibly cover them all here, but if you look at the documentation, you'll be able to see that. So we have those three layers. We have data, we have aesthetics, and we have geometries. But that's not all that the grammar of graphics lets us do. Um, we actually get this, this whole sandwich of layers here that let us describe um, how plots are made and lets us make plots using these different layers here. And we can keep sequentially adding these layers um, just using the plus sign, the ggplot, and add uh, functions that change the scales, that change the facets, that add labels, that change the theme. So we'll talk about each of these additional layers here really quick. So scales, they change the properties of how the variable is mapped. Um, so we saw that already with the, the gapminder plot where we used scale log 10. We didn't change any of the data. We didn't like, go into the, into the data set and make a new column for logged data. All we did is we said ggplot needs to log the x-axis and to change that. And so it did that as we plotted. Um, there's a scale for any aesthetic that you're using. So if you have a color aesthetic, you can say scale color gradient, and it's going to use a gradient color scale instead of discrete color scales. Um, if you want to use the viridis palette that we talked about um, last time where it's perceptually uniform and it's easier to read for people who are colorblind or if you're trying to represent um, numerical data as colors, you, can, you don't have to figure out what those colors are. You don't have to do any of the mapping yourself. You just have to tell ggplot to use the viridis scale and it will handle that for you. So if you look here, this is we already saw this with the, the Gapminder data. This is now using the log 10 axis. Um, if we want it to be colored um, with the Viridis palette, we can just add the scale color Viridis layer, and it will change. So if you notice, this is the default ggplot colors, um, these pink, yellowish, turquoise-ish blue things. Um, all we have to do is add this one layer, and it switches to this Viridis scale, um, which is pretty nice. Facets are another one of the layers that we can add as part of the grammar of graphics. And what this does is it creates subplots based on one of the columns in our data set. And so um, if you add a layer called like facet wrap here, and then we're going to facet by continent, what that's going to do is separate that single plot into five separate smaller plots, um, one little plot for each of the continents. Um, you can actually facet by multiple things. And so if we do this right here, that's going to create um, mini plots for continent and year. So you're going to have an Africa 2007, an Africa 2008, an Africa 2009, an Asia 2007, Asia 2008, Asia 2009. So that can get unwieldy. You're going to have dozens of plots. Um, you can also change how they're plotted here. So if you want it all in one single column, you can do that. If you want it all in one single row, you can do that. You can make it be like a three by three situation. So you just say n row equals three, and it'll do three rows. So some examples of facet layers are this right here. So that's, this is the same Gapminder data, um, that same scatter plot that we saw before. All we did to change it is we added this facet wrap layer and we're wrapping it by or we're faceting it by continent. So you can see the subplots here now with Africa, the Americas, Asia, Europe, and Oceania. Those two dots, by the way, I think it's uh, New Zealand and Australia. It doesn't have the Pacific Islands or anything like that. Um, if we want to do multiple facets um, or facet by multiple variables, here this is faceting by continent and year. And so we have this top row is 2002 and the bottom row is 2007 but then there's separate plots for each of the continents, which is pretty cool. And so all we had to do to make this fancy plot here, we didn't have to make 10 different individual plots. We just had to add one single layer to our ggplot code, and it automatically made all of the subplots for us, which is um, super convenient. Um, another layer you can add are these things called coordinates. Um, this just changes the coordinate system that you use. You don't use this very often. Um, really, the only situation where you use this is for zooming in on things. 
Um, by default, all plots in ggplot use this Cartesian coordinate system, which just means there's an x-axis and a y-axis. That's all chord Cartesian means. So you don't typically have to mess with it. If you do add a chord Cartesian layer, you're going to do something like this, where you're going to change the y limits or the x limits and zoom in on a specific section. So if we ran this, if we included this layer here, um, it would plot all of the data, but then it would only show values that are between 1 and 10 on the y axis. And it's going to just show like a, a sliver of the data. You can use chord flip to switch the x and the y axis. And so if you have like box plots that are going up and down, if you add chord flip, it'll make them all go horizontal. Um, chord polar, you're very rarely going to use. That's going to be polar coordinates like um, with pi and theta and other circular systems. The only situation where you ever use that really is with uh, pie charts, which you don't typically use anyway. But pie charts are basically just a bar chart on a polar system that's wrapped around, and you don't really need to worry about that. So really, the only situation where you're ever going to use these chord systems is if you're going to zoom in on something in a plot. So here's an example here. If we take that same Gapminder plot um, with the health and wealth, and we add this chord Cartesian layer where we just say zoom in between 70 and 80 years and $10,000 and $30,000 in income, you can see that it's zoomed in there. It's not throwing away any of the data. Like you can see this point is partially cut off here because it's kind of off of the plot. Um, the data is all still there. We're just zooming in on one specific section of it. Um, this is an example of chord flip where now life expectancy is on the x-axis, GDP per capita is on the y. Um, I don't know why you would do that because you could also just map life expectancy to X and GDP per capita to Y instead of having this be Y and then flipping it, but it's possible. A um, couple final layers that you can add when you're working with this grammar of graphics. You can add a labels layer. Um, this is simpler than the others because it's actually just a single function in R. It's this labs function. And then you inside labs, you can say, I want the title to be something, or the caption to be something, or the y axis to show something. There's a whole bunch of different ways that you can label things. This example shows lots of them. And so this is the same Gapminder plot. We have, again, this aesthetics. We have x equals GDP per capita, y equals life expectancy, continent is, or it's colored by continent, it's sized by population. We have our points, we have our x axis logged. And then we just have one labs function here, and this is where we say title is going to be this, and subtitle is going to be that. And so all of these things um, map directly onto the graph here. And so we have a caption, we have a subtitle, we have access titles, we have legend titles. All of that gets included um, just with this one labs layer that we add. Um, finally, the last layer that we can add is a theme layer, which changes the appearance of things in the plot um, beyond just like the colors. So we already changed some of the appearance with the, the scale viridis, where we changed the, the, the continents from the ggplot defaults to that fancier scale with the blue and yellow. Um, the themes let you change parts of the plot, like the actual background of the plot, the fonts, how th thick the, the access titles are, if you want them bold or if you want them italicized. Um, there are a whole bunch of built-in themes. If you're using R, you can type theme underscore, and then it'll bring up a pop-up menu of a whole bunch of different themes that you can switch to. The default is theme gray. Um, so that's why it has, it has this gray background here with these white um, axis lines here. Um, but you can also switch to theme black and white, theme dark, theme minimal. Um, so here's, some, here's an example of theme dark. This is that same Gapminder plot, but the only thing we changed is we added theme dark to it. And so now instead of using that light gray as this dark gray, it changes the colors a little bit. Um, you can also use theme minimal, which, which gets rid of the plot border here. Um, it doesn't have a gray background. It's kind of a cleaner feel. Um, you can just mess with the different themes and figure out which ones look good. There are also R packages that you can install that include other themes that people have made. Um, often people try to make themes that look like they belong somewhere else, and so you can use theme Stata to make plots that look like you made them in Stata. You can use theme Wall Street Journal to make a graph that looks like it belongs in Wall Street Journal. 
Um, they have this package has a whole bunch of others for like theme 538, theme New York Times, theme um, Washington Post to to kind of copy that same that same look and feel. Um, lots of organizations actually do this internally. The BBC has posted their theme. If you click on this link here, you can go um, and download their package um, where you can just use theme underscore BBC and create um, plots that look like they are published at the BBC's website because this is what they actually do. They All of these plots here that go on their news website are made in ggplot um, using their internal theme. You can also... Um, kind of make minor theme adjustments and there are like millions of possible options here it's a very complicated theming system um, we have a whole class session in a couple in a week um, dedicated to how to make little tiny adjustments like this this is just one example where if you start with kind of the black and white theme this will move the legend to the bottom this will make the plot title bold this will get rid of that grid on the pan like the grid lines and this will make the, the y-axis title italic. Um, all of those things will, will change specific tiny elements of the plot. So we just explored a few examples of these different layers here. Um, these are the main core layers that you deal with when you're, when you're working with ggplot. You have themes, labels, coordinates, facets, scales, geometries, aesthetics, and data. Um, there are tons of different types of facets and scales and geometries and coordinates and themes, and we'll be talking about that throughout the semester. Um, if you look at the ggplot documentation again, their whole kind of help file is organized around these layers, and there's sections for aesthetics, there's sections for geometries and for scales, etc. And so I'd recommend kind of looking at that all the time. Um, it's really actually super helpful if you click on any of the geoms that you're interested in if you want to make a box plot. Um, it will have code showing how to make a box plot and change different options for it. It'll have like 10 different examples of different box plots and with the, showing the code to make them, which is really, really convenient. And so I would recommend looking at that. Um, so we can kind of, to help you understand this more completely. What we can do is build a single plot and do it very sequentially where we're going to add each of these layers that we've talked about as part of this grammar of graphics. And we'll talk about it using this new language for describing graphs. So let's go ahead and get started here. What we're going to be doing is plotting the relationship between engine displacement and cars, which I think is like how heavy the engine is. I don't know anything about cars. It's just a commonly used variable. Um, so the relationship between displacement and highway miles per gallon. So we want to see if heavier cars get better mileage. So we're going to start with setting our data. There's a data set called MPG that exists when you use ggplot. So you can use this if you want. Um, and then we're going to map displacement to the x-axis, highway miles per gallon to the y-axis, and the drive of the car, so if it's front wheel drive or rear wheel drive or four wheel drive, we're gonna color the points by drive. And so if we just run this, we get an empty plot. And the reason it's empty is because we haven't told it how to actually draw the mappings that we've made. We haven't added any geometries like geom point or geom line or anything like that. And so what we can do is add geom point. And so here now, um, the displacement highway and drive are all represented by a specific geometry at this point. We can actually add multiple geoms. Um, so here we're going to add geom smooth. So we still have the points, but now we've added kind of a smooth line that tries to fit the data the best way possible. And it's trying to draw a line for each of the, the types of drives, the front wheel drive and rear wheel drive and four wheel drive. Um, because we've mapped color onto drive. So we have these three different lines there. If we want those lines to be straight, like linear models, um, we can just change, um, we can add one argument inside GM Smooth. And so now those are straight lines using LM, which is R's way of saying linear model. Okay, then we're gonna change the scale. We're gonna color these, instead of coloring them with the default uh, ggplot colors, we're going to use the Viridis scale. So to do that, all we have to do is say scale color Viridis, and it switches. Um, we can then facet this and add a faceting layer. 
And if we facet it by drive, it's going to split it into three subplots, one for four-wheel drive, one for front-wheel drive, and one for rear-wheel drive. And so now we have those separate plots. All we had to do was tell it to facet by drive. Um, we didn't have to do any manual work to separate these things. It just split it out. Um, we can add another layer for labels. And so now we have all sorts of labels and um, titles and subtitles and legend titles and access titles and captions. Those all get added on. And then we can add a theme. So instead of using theme gray, we're now using theme black and white, which looks like this. And then we can do some theme tweaks where if we want the legend to be at the bottom, we say legend position equals bottom. And if we want that plot title to be bold, we can say plot title equals um, this code here to make it bold. And then that is the finished product here. Um, so we went through that slowly, but if we go back, we can actually kind of flip through this like a flip book. And we can say like we start here and all we're doing is just adding layers sequentially and it is changing and getting enhanced and improving. And so just by adding each of those layers from the grammar of graphics, um, it's modifying the plot and changing things and fastening things, recoloring things. Um, and that's how we create graphs that are fairly complicated with R. So let's go through it again, just because it's so cool. Um, so it starts with this blank plot, and then it gets fancier and more complicated and new things added to it until it reaches that point right there. Just with adding new um, grammar of graphics layers um, onto this plot. So the nice thing about having this, this language of, of plot elements is it lets you create far more detailed plots um, than you would ordinarily. So like in a program like Excel, when you want to create a specific chart type, you have to click on the menu that they have in the ribbon, and then you have to scroll through and find the chart that you want. And if your data is not in the exact format that it needs to create a pie chart or a stacked bar chart or um, this side-by-side -side chart, uh, bar chart or a scatter plot or anything like that, you have to like copy and paste the columns and reshape them and make it fit what Excel requires for the, the graph to happen. And so what you really learn in Excel is how to make specific chart types. And that's, that's kind of how you create data graphics in most programs. In programs that use the grammar of graphics, though, um, once you learn all of the different layers, um, you can create pretty much anything. You just have to know how to map the specific columns onto pieces of the graph and then how to represent that mapping with different geometries. R is not the only thing that does this. Um, Tableau. Um, also uses this grammar of graphics idea where you have multiple columns and you can map them onto different parts of the graph. Um, and so the nice thing about this is it lets you actually talk about graphs um, using kind of a universal language and you can describe a graph in detail just talking about each of these different layers that are part of the grammar of graphics. So for instance, um, this plot here if you were trying to describe to somebody how they could recreate it, um, you could say, I want a scatter plot, like two scatter plots that show continent somehow and also show population and life expectancy, expectancy and GDP per capita, but you have to do it separately in Excel and make different chart types and figure out how to resize them, and that's tricky. Um, instead, you can just use this sentence right here. If you look at this, this is the same plot just explained in words where we map wealth to the x-axis we map health to the y-axis we add points we color by continent we size by population we scale the x-axis with a log and we facet by year um, and so that is just like the english language version of explaining each of the layers that we've added on using this grammar of graphics approach and then once we translate that to code if you can describe a plot that you want to make using this language then the code follows this. So we want to map wealth to the x-axis. So we say x equals GDP per capita, health to the y-axis, y equals life expectancy, color to continent, size by population, check. We want points, check. We want the x-axis to use a log, check. And we want to facet by year, check. So just following that sentence, we can build the code for the plot and then it creates the plot for us, um, which is pretty cool. And that works for any type of plot. So if you look here, this is um, a, 
histogram showing life expectancy across the different continents. Um, but using the grammar of graphics language, we say that this is we've mapped health to the x-axis, we've added a histogram with bins at every five years, and then we've filled the histograms and faceted by continent. And so there's different colors for each of the continents, and then they're separated out into the different facets. And using that same sentence, we can create the same we can create the code for it, um, basically following that sentence. One more example here. Um, this right here is a violin plot layered onto a box plot that shows both. That shows the distribution, um, shows the interquartile range, shows the, the density of the different life expectancy groups across continents here. Um, good luck making this in Excel first. Um, Tableau can do this because it follows the grammar of graphics, but if we talk about this as like in an English language sentence, we map the we map continent to the x-axis, we map health to the y-axis, we add violin plots and box plots, and we make the box plots semi-transparent so you can see both, and we fill by continent. Um, the code for that follows that sentence pretty precisely. Um, and so you can describe, if you describe this to somebody who needs to make a, a chart, they can follow kind of your instructions using that grammar of graphics language to create the same chart there. And so what, what's really exciting and powerful about this grammar of graphics idea is that it, it does create kind of a more universal way of describing graphs and explaining where the data is showing up in each of the graphs and how to color them and how to size them. Um, and so that's um, a powerful principle that we're going to be working with throughout the rest of this mini-mister. Um, so you'll get lots of practice with that throughout the rest of this course.